Hey, um, I couldn't get out of Pullman, Washington uh, this morning. I did a, I was asked to go over to, uh, to Pullman to do a black history presentation for the African American uh, students over there. And because they didn't have funding, we ended up having to have to do it in a community center. So I blasted the president about that and tried to tell them students they don't need to go in there and ask them for no money. Then you go up there and demand it. Hell, we pay enough tax dollars for it. But anyway, um, <laughs> with that said, most of you, uh, I just want to talk about how I, I got into black history. And this was the first calendar I did uh, some time ago back. It was dated in 1993. And then people didn't want to tear the pages off, so I did a second edition, which is what you see here. And then recently, my wife and a friend of mine convinced me to do a third edition of Black Heritage Day. And the way that I got involved in black history was there was a white guy that I worked with by the name of Henry Cody. And Henry would oftentimes come to work and tell me about different people out of black history. And one of the first people he told me about was Henry O. Flipper, who in 1877 became the first African-American to graduate from the West Point Military Academy. And when he went there, he went there for four years and no one ever spoke to him. And I was inspired by the fact that, uh, of knowing something so beautiful, but at the same time, I was appalled and embarrassed that this white man knew more about my history than I did. So I felt compelled to do something about it. Um, let me tell you the significance of that, because I believe history helps to value our lives. Uh, I was driving down the road uh, the day after Halle Berry and Denzel won the Oscar, and Dory Monson was on his radio program, and he was talking about how pathetic Halle Berry sounded uh, in her acceptance speech. And then, of course, all the callers were calling up talking about how pathetic she sounded. And I just about couldn't take, I couldn't take any more of this, so I felt the need to call in up on him. And what I called in to tell him is that while he's looking at her uh, acceptance speech is just being that. I said, you need to understand the historical accomplishment of what happened before you can understand her acceptance speech. And again, this is part of us knowing our history and embracing it. So I had to tell him that in 1940, the first African American to ever win the Oscar was Hattie McDaniel for her role in Gone with the Wind. And then the first African American to even be nominated for Best Actress was Dorothy Dandridge, whom Halle Berry played. The first African-American male to ever be nominated was Sidney Poitier in 1956, and then ultimately to win the Best Actors Award in 1963 for Lilies of the Field. And then the second African-American female to ever win was Whoopi Goldberg, and that was 54 years after Hattie McDaniel. And so then when you come to that night, it wasn't that Halle Berry was crying because she won, as most white actresses were. She was crying because she realized that she had lifted a 74-year yoke off the neck of black women who had been actresses. Woo! And so, again, it, that's the importance of history. Now, if you're not careful with history, uh, people will define who we are as a people. Now, I, I want to give you this example of what our children are learning. And the more they go through society, the, more, the less they seem to learn about our history. And if we as black folks think that we embrace our culture, then why are we allowing our children to go to school that's basically a Eurocentric form of education that teaches them nothing beautiful about themselves? Let me, let me just take this example. Uh, here's four textbooks. The most recent one is copyrighted in 1994. The latter is copyrighted in 1863. Now, it's a commonly known fact that the first person to die in defense of this country was who? Crispus Attucks. Let me show you how history will treat us, how history has treated us. We've already seen it with uh, Cleopatra, because now most of us are thinking that she's what, Elizabeth Taylor. But now, <laughs> look at this well-known fact. 1863, what does it say? Crispus Attucks was what? The first to fall. There is no doubt about it. He was the first to die, the first, the first to defy, and the first to die in defense of this country. Now look at the textbook in 1950. 1950, same thing. The first civilian killed, Christopher Saddix. No doubt about it. But now take a look at the book that was copyrighted in 1990. What does it say? He, he's not the first no more. He's just among those. Now look at the book in 1994. Five men, including Addicts. Now, 20 years from now, they don't even want to mention his name. But this is what will happen if we allow folks to define who we are uh, in history. Now, I don't know if you all have gone through the history of Black History Month, how February became Black History Month. And I've yet to do a presentation without giving honor to this man because it, through our ignorance, and I ain't say stupidity, just through our ignorance, sometimes we blame white folks for things we shouldn't blame them for. February, they gave us the coldest and shortest month out of the year. So I think it's imperative that we talk about how February became Black History Month. There was a child born in New Canaan, Virginia in 1875, and for the first 20 years of his life, he couldn't go to school. He had to stay at home and help support his family, seeing as though his family had just come out of slavery with the passage of the 13th Amendment in 1865. At the age of 20, with no formal education, it took him less than two years to graduate uh, high school. He went to Berea College in Berea, Kentucky, went to the University of Chicago, and in 1912, 
This child received a PhD from Harvard University. This marked the first time and the only time in the history of our country that a black person who was a direct descendant of slaves had ever received a PhD, and he got that PhD from Harvard. The man that I'm talking about is Dr. Carter G. Woodson, a renowned historian, a renowned educator. Dr. Woodson understood the importance of our history. So in 1915, he founded a group called the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. In 1921, he founded a group called Associated Publishers, and these two groups, they had four goals. One was to promote the writing and research, and I don't know what just happened to my PowerPoint. <laughs> One was to promote the writing and research of African American history. Oh my goodness. Give me a second here, people. All right, we're right back in it. Okay, one is to promote the writing and research of African American history. The second one was to promote the publishing of quality black information because many times publishing companies were owned by folks other than us and if they chose not to publish anything quality about us, they simply didn't do it. The next thing he wanted to do was to promote the study of African American history in our schools, colleges, universities, churches, fraternity groups, sorority groups, workplace, but the most important place he wanted us to study African American history is in the home. I would probably attest that most of our children, most of your children probably were not taught academia African-American history. Most of us didn't learn. But before I put that condemnation on you, I'll simply put it on me. I know my mother and father never taught me anything about African-American history because they didn't know from an academia standpoint. The next thing he wanted us to do was to promote the collection of African-American history. The most shining example of that is a library in New York City called the Schaumburg Library. It serves as this country's single greatest literary source for housing African-American history. Now, if you were to go to this library right across the street, the downtown library, you're going to probably go to a little small area that's dedicated to the African-American experience which says that they put no value, or at least they don't understand our culture, our understanding of history. But the same thing applies to your house. If I were to go in your house, I saw no picture of you. I should be able to walk in your house without seeing one picture of you, look at the art on your walls, and tell you who lives at that house. Now, I got a cousin in Mississippi, and when you walk in her house, you would swear an Asian lives there. Asian <laughs> stuff everywhere. Now, I live in Auburn, Washington, and my grass cut just as clean as anybody else, so you wouldn't know my from the outside. But the moment you walk through that door without seeing one picture of me or my family, the first thing you're going to say is, a brother certainly lives here. You're going to go to my books and see black books. You're going to go to my music and see black music. So he wanted us to collect African-American history. The first observance of what we now call Black History Month was in 1926. It was called Negro History Week. They replaced the word Negro with the word black, and it became Black History Week about mid-1970s, keeping in mind that Dr. Woodson died in 1950. He chose the second week in February in honor of two men, Abraham Lincoln, who was born February 12th, and Frederick Douglass, who was born February 14th. But Frederick was like many slaves. He didn't know the exact date of his birthday, but when he was a child, his mother used to call him My Little Valentine. So Frederick Douglass chose that day as his birthday. And that's how February became Black History Month. But now the question is this, why should we as black folk have a Black History Month? And we have all the answers. If you don't know where you're going, how could you know where you're, if you don't know where you're being, how you know where you're going? But I moved beyond that, and I moved beyond that for a personal reason. I kept asking myself, why is it important that we say, oh, it's the first black to do this, the first black man to do this, the first black, why is that so important? I don't hear nobody else saying that. But why with us? Why are we so concerned about any accomplishment that black folks do? History. Let us take a look at how history throughout this country has defined us as a people. In 1782, in his notes on Virginia, Thomas Jefferson said this, I advance it therefore as a suspicion only that black, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to whites in both the endowment of both body and mind. This is a president of the United States. If he believes that we are so inferior, what do you think times were like for us as a people in 1782? Now let us go on. This is a senator on the floor of the United States Senate in 1866 when black folks, they was trying to figure out, okay, now that we freed them with the 13th Amendment, should we now give them the right to vote? Senator Lot Morrell, look what he says. He says the term Negro is an ethological term. It does not comprehend the dusky, the, uh, all the blacks, much less the dusky families of man. It refers to that race which Culver describes as being marked by a black complexion, crisp or woolly hair, uh, a compressed cranium and a flat nose. The projection of the lower parts of the jaw, the face, 
The lips, the thick lips, evidently approximate him to the monkey tribe. <laughs> this is a United States senator. He goes on to say this to the president of the Senate. Mr. President, the Negro knows but two conditions. If he lives singly, he lives as a savage. If he lives in a civilized society, he should live as a slave. So what do you think this country was thinking about us if this is a, a man of the United States Senate speaking this way? Now, here was a book that a neighbor of mine gave me that was published in 1891. It's kind of an encyclopedia Britannica. It has a little bit of everything. One of the pages it has in it is a page they call the characteristics of the races. They describe the race of man, and they describe their intellectual and social skills. Look how they describe or define the white or the Aryan race. It's possessed with the highest grade of intellect, endowed with all the races and obtained in knowledge. And as knowledge is power, he's also the most progressive has exercised the greatest and most continuous influence upon the affairs of mankind, at least within the historic period. And he does not show any symptoms of decay, but is contrary, daily achieving new triumphs. That's a beautiful definition. So after hearing the way they define white folks, you know I had to be real interested on how they defined us. This is how they define the black or the Ethiopian race. You're rather imitative than intellectual, but perhaps owning to a lack of opportunity as much to any innate deficiency with a marked natural talent for music. <laughs> you have been and still are mostly sunk in barbarianism. You're scarcely to be considered a progressive race and you have exercised no progress upon the affairs of humanity. Zero, this is how we were defined, but that's 1891. My mentor, Dr. Jones, wrote a book in 1994 called 40 Acres and a Mule, The Rape of Colored America. I took an excerpt from that book because I was very much interested in it. It was an excerpt from Nixon. And Dr. Jones says this, but now I must stop and turn to the racially explosive diaries left behind by H.R. Haldeman, chief of staff for the late President Richard M. Nixon. Parts of the tape, the 1969 entries were broadcast on ABC's Nightline where Nixon said, and I quote, there has never in history been an adequate black nation and they are the only race for which this is true. Nixon was president during our lifetime. Again, president of arguably one of the greatest countries in the history of this world. So can you imagine why times were the way they were? This is the president of the United States. Look how he has defined us. Look at what he thinks about us. And then the book comes out in the, in the early 90s, the bell curve that says what? We are intellectually inferior. And then look at our children in school now. The achievement gap is widening and we're busy worrying about the discipline they get. Damn it, if we put some discipline on them at home, maybe these, these teachers wouldn't have to raise them and they could try and teach them. <laughs> but beyond that, we have turned our children over to another people and said, teach my children. God has ordained us to be the original teacher. Joshua is my student. He will be my student until he leaves my roof. No teacher will say they are his teacher. You are on loan, but I will be his teacher. And you better know he's gonna, he gonna grow up with an Afrocentric understanding of who he is as a black man. <laughs> he will understand that. So when I ask the question, why should black folks have a Black History Month? This man gives me the most eloquent answer to that. Here we are, as a people, having experienced political domination, economic exploitation, segregation, and humiliation for well now 344 years, and yet the demands of history make it necessary for us to be as productive and as responsible as the people who never had our experiences. Now these experiences have rooted themselves in the forms of slavery and segregation and discrimination. And I think that we could all agree that probably the most damaging effects of slavery and segregation and discrimination has been what it has done to the souls of the segregated as well as the segregator. You see, it has given the segregator a false sense of superiority and it has left the segregated with a false sense of inferiority. How many of you can say that you've met white folks who just feel like you don't even have the right to step to them that way? Yeah. That is their feeling of superiority. I remember at Mississippi State trying to study engineering. I couldn't even spell thermodynamics, and I'm sitting in a class trying to understand the first and second law of enthalpy. These white kids are asking questions. I'm like, what the hell? How do they even know to ask that question? But history teaches me that my mother, I didn't know no black engineers in my past. What black engineers did I know? Their mothers and fathers was engineers. In the summertime, they worked for those companies. They came in there with the basis of engineering. I had no basis of it. Why? 
because history wouldn't allow my people to be engineers, wouldn't allow them to go to schools. So had I understood this, I might not have suffered at Mississippi State the way I did. And I contest to you today that our children still suffer from an inferiority complex. Play you some uh, Nelly and watch them just roll with the most uh, incredible moves in the world. Ask them a question about academia and they shut up like a damn mice. Just barely hear them because they still suffering from that inferiority complex. And we must give them their history so that we can eradicate that from them and show them what our people have gone through in this country so now they put a value on education. Mm -hmm. They have to value that. I'm not gonna go through this part. I wanna skip down because there's a part that I wanna get to. I wanna, I wanna talk about reparations if y'all don't mind. Good, hold on one second. Hold on one second. And normally I would go through it, but seeing as though I'm late, I want to take this. Boy, don't tell me that. Okay, how, how, many, of you, how many of you believe that we should have reparations? Okay, all right, for those of you who don't, and even those of you who do, the problem that I have with us arguing for reparations is that our argument is strictly an emotional argument. And so what has happened is, I remember when David Horowitz was at the University of Washington, and, and Horowitz is going around the country with 12 reasons why black folks shouldn't receive reparations. He's in Kane Hall, and there's got to be four, 500 folks in Kane Hall, predominantly white. And they are just loving Horowitz. Horowitz makes the argument, why should this person have to pay this person this person didn't enslave her. Slavery ended 150 years ago. She's not 150 years old, and she wasn't no slave 150 years ago. So why should she today have to pay her today? If you find an entity that was a direct beneficiary of slavery or people who was a direct beneficiary of slavery, then maybe those people should pay. But there are no people living who was around 150 years ago. Then he goes on to say, but if you can find them, then they should be made to pay. All these white folks, they were just clapping. They were just in love with David. And I stood like a big, tall, black stallion. And I said, David, I got but one question for you. By your definition, can you explain to me Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution? Hmm? Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution says this. The migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit should not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808, but a tax or a duty may be imposed on such importation not exceeding $10 for each person. You know what that's talking about? That's talking about the slave trade. I was over at Washington State University and their black history professor, who's a doctor, a dean or something, was arguing reparations, and he was emotional. I gave him Article 1, Section 9, he said, Mr. Mack, have you written a paper on this? I said, no, I'm just a little old engineer. I don't know nothing about this. But I'll tell you what happened when I said that to Horowitz. Horowitz raised up and got up out of there. Everybody was saying, David, answer him. So what I said to him is this. My argument for reparations is, again, in the most fundamental, the most important document in the history of this country, you go look at the Constitution of the United States. Now, what in layman terms does Article 1, Section 9 say? According to David, if you can find somebody who benefited from slavery, that was alive yesterday, and if they're still alive today, and they made money off slavery, they should have to pay. So when I introduced Article 1, Section 9 to David, I say, my brother, according to the Constitution of the United States, the government, what is the only entity in this country that can collect a tax? The government. According to the Constitution, a tax or a duty may be imposed on such what? What about migration? They were never talking about migration. The only thing they was talking about was the importation of slaves. And so this country received a tax of how much? $10 for every slave that was imported to this country. So then I was looking at Donahue the other night, me and Jamie O, and they had these people arguing about reparations. They said, well, you can't calculate it. I said, I'd be damned. <laughs> I could calculate it. See, I was an engineer, and inside engineering, we took this little course called Engineering Economy. So let me show you how you calculate it. 
You use your formulas. <laughs> and we are particularly interested in the compound amount. For those of you who don't know what those terms are, shall we go through them? <laughs> I is going to be the interest rate. N, that's going to be the investment period. In this case, a number of years. P, that's the present amount of money that they made on us in 1788. And F, that's what they owe us today. That formula will look something like this. F is equal to P times 1 plus I to the N. Shall we now run the numbers? <laughs> Now, according to the Constitution, they imported slaves from 1788 to 1808. That's a 20-year period. So then I went to look up the first census in this country, which happened in 1810. I extrapolated just a little bit, went back a couple of years, and I said that over that 20-year period, it is apparent to me that they imported at least 700,000 slaves. Even though the Constitution say you take up to $10, we gonna take the whole $10 because this country participated in that nefarious debasement of humankind. So we taking the whole $10. We're only going to apply a 6% interest, not the Queen Latifah 18% interest on the Freedom Card. And we've been owing this money for 214. That's last year's number, ain't it, baby? My bad, it's 215 years. But for the purpose of this lecture, we will look at last year's amount of what they owe us. 700,000 times 10 is what? Seven million. Seven million at 6% interest for 214 years, and the math don't lie. If you want to, you can say the number with me. One trillion, 822 billion, 20 million, 280 thousand dollars is what they owe you can oh my bad and 23 cents <laughs> but do you understand the logic behind it so when i gave david horowitz this horowitz packed his bag and left that is what knowledge of oneself would do we don't have to argue emotionally about how, s how slavery tore up the family. Okay, fine. Just imagine the corporations to pay us. Okay, which corporation? Boeing, Microsoft, AT&T? No, no, no. The government is the biggest corporation in this country. And thank God that there is a beautiful God because he put their crime in the greatest document in the history of this country, the Constitution. Now, if you want to think about reparations, understand this. This country... Again, they think of us forever. How dare you ask for something? How dare you? Now, I want you to imagine this, that you are as old as you are right now. It's 1865. It's the 13th Amendment. You just got word from the federal government that you've been working on this plantation all your life, but now you's free. <laughs> you's free. So what you's going to do? Where's you's going to go? How you's going to live? The government understood this. Lincoln and his administration understood this. So on March 3rd, 1865, Lincoln signed into law the Freedmen's Bureau. It was to do four things. It was to give land to these newly freed slaves because Lincoln said, wait a minute. These people have been working this land all their life. Let's make them self-sufficient. Let's give them some land. Let's give education to the newly freed slaves. That's where your historical black colleges and universities came out of. And the person that was heading the Freedmen's Bureau was a man named Oliver Otis Howard, the white man for whom Howard University is named after. The third thing he wanted to do was give you political power. That's why during Reconstruction, you had your first black governor, PBS Pinchback. You had black superintendents, black judges, black everything all through the South. In, in power. Then he wanted to give you protection. That's why he, we sent federal troops down in the South to protect us while we served. But now I'm only going to focus on that first one. 40 acres and a mule. Is it fact or fiction? It's not a Spike Lee production. It is fact. So here's the history of 40 acres and a mule. Sherman was on his march to the sea during the Civil War, burning down everything in his path. As he burned down plantation homes, black folks fell right in line with him. When Sherman gets to Savannah, he looks behind him. Oh, my goodness, y'all just hold up. Wait on the plantation. We like, are you out your mind? We're not waiting on that plantation. So Sherman got to Savannah. He met with 20 black leaders. 
he asked them, do you want your own land or do you want to live amongst these people? They say, Sherman, now you know we need our own land. So Sherman issued special field order number 15 on January 16, 1865. Go read the document for yourself. I will present it to you, and this is what it says. From Charleston, South Carolina, 30 miles back from the sea, all the way down to the St. John River in Florida, this land is to be set aside for the exclusive settlement of blacks. Each family is to receive 40 acres of tillable land. Now, I want y'all to just take a look at that land. In particular, look at all this over here. See that? All that, that's oceanfront property, people. But now look at what the document says. This is the excerpt from it. Look at it. See this? The islands from Charleston. But now down here, I want you to pay attention to the land he's talking about. Buford. Hilton Head. Do you know what they're doing on Hilton Head now? That's where they play the masters. Get off my land. <laughs> so this is what happened to your 40 acres and a mule. Special field order number 15 was sent up to the Congress at Senate Bill number 60. When it went up to the Congress at Senate Bill number 60, there were three white men who helped us out. Lyman Turnbull from Illinois, Thaddeus Stevens from Pennsylvania in the House of Representatives and Charles Sumner in the Senate from Massachusetts. Now, Thaddeus Stevens got the bill through the House. Charles Sumner and Lyman Turnbull got it through the Senate. Now, when a bill passes both houses, what does it need to become law? I'm just a bill and I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. All it needed was the president's signature. But on April 14, 1865, our good president, Lincoln, was sitting in Forest Theater. John Wilkes Booth walked up behind him and shot him in the back of the head. When he shot him in the back of the head, it was during Lincoln's second term as president. His vice president was a Democrat of the slaveholding party, Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson vetoed Senate Bill number 60. He began to systematically tear apart the Freedmen's Bureau. So remember when Clinton went through his impeachment and you kept hearing about the first American president to be impeached? It was Johnson. Johnson was the first president impeached and they impeached him because he began to pardon all the ex-Confederates that took the South out of the Union and he gave them back their land. And they impeached him for that. So that's what happened to our 40 acres and a mule. It was this knucklehead. <laughs> so is it fact or fiction? Reparations is real. But black folk, they don't owe us nothing. We're always taking that approach. They don't owe us. I'll be damned. This country owes. Even during the apology, when we had our black, I mean, Bill Clinton, even with Clinton, as sympathetic as he appeared to be for us, Clinton couldn't even offer an apology. Because once you apologize, the question is, what you apologizing for? And that's going to make you have to go back through this history. Same thing with the Confederate flag. The Confederate flag is a debatable issue as it flies over the state capital, Mississippi. Black folks voted two to one to keep the Confederate flag. History does not forgive those who lose their way. We must get inside our history. Now, the last portion I'm going to leave you with is this. How many of us ever use this term? Raise your hand if you ever use this term, ever. If you ever use it. Boy, some lying folks up in here. I'm going to tell you right now. I right, understand this. And don't be proud of it. But then some of, uh, but okay, but here it is. Let, 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 let me tell you this. I'm from Mississippi. We used to use the word nigga like the word duh. That nigga crazy, nigga please, nigga, 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 nigga all over the place. Now, ever since I've come to embrace my history, I come to love who I am. See, the word nigga, or the derivation thereof, is an American-made word. It's an American-made word meant to devalue us, dehumanize us. And then I see a brother walk in proud. I, that's the sickness that we as a people got. I still contend that black folks fear three things. We fear our history, we fear white folk, and we fear each other. Damn it, you won't even speak to each other now. <laughs> Looking at me today like there's something's wrong with me. I'm proper now. 
History done squared me up. That's why I fight these fools the way I do. I have no fear with them. I've understood the poison that they put inside of me, teaching me to call myself a nigga, then claiming I love who I am as a black man. It makes no sense. How the rest of the world is going to respect us if we can't respect ourselves? So I tell you what. <laughs> For those of you who think he's so high and mighty, ain't nothing wrong with the word nigga, then look at that nigga. Hmm? What about them two niggas? As a matter of fact, look at the way that nigga's neck is cracked. Hmm? Look at that nigga. They beat his britches off, eh? Oh, if it sounds ugly, that's how it sounds when I hear it say it. That's how it sounds to me. The reason why is I embrace this pain. Oh, I don't run from my history. I like to sit there and cry. I love it. It cleanses me. It hardens me. Makes me love who I am. Look at them two. See, I think you understand what I'm saying. Now look at this brother's back. What manner of man could take a, a brother's back and beat it till it looks like a grapevine like that? How could you be so insensitive? Now, there's some Negro narratives because our children have come to, I mean, black folk, for as little as we know about our history, we will use any justification for this word. White people say nigger, we say nigger. <laughs> there ain't no difference. So I started reading the slave narratives. There was a Writers Project Association. They went back in the 1920s to find blacks still living that had been enslaved. And they sat down and they took our stories. And I love to read Negro dialect. It's a beautiful thing. We used to joke about it when, you know, the whole Ebonics thing. Ebonics is nothing to joke about. Ebonics is pure genius. I want you to imagine somebody takes you to Russia right now, never teach you Russian, and then you getting beat down and you got to try to understand what somebody say, mimic what they saying, and then put the correct meaning to it. That's what our ancestors had to do with this thing they call the English language. And so when I hear my grandmama talking about, Carl, you go across the street over there, child, get my, I know exactly what grandmama was saying to me. That's pure genius. Nobody sat my grandmother down and taught her anything. But we laugh about that. Look how country she sounds. Country? <laughs> but that's the way we are with our people. So here's this story that I read in particular about this brother. It goes something like this. My name is William Colbert. <laughs> I was from Georgia. So I was born on 1844 on my master's plantation down in Fort Valley. Uh, my master was named Jim Holderson. You know, at one time he had 165 other niggas. No, sir, nobody liked to be bought up by him because he was so mean. You know, I remember one time my brother Jane, where he was on the plantation seeing a gal when the time on his pass and get out. He's over in Iron Lake. Oh, when the master found out about it, he was mad as a hive of bees. And Brother Jan, where one of the biggest, finest niggas I ever did see. Oh, the master took down his long mule stunt, and he tied Brother Jan up to a big old pine tree. And he ripped off his shirt, and he said, Now, nigga, I'm going to teach you some sense. And with that, he started laying on the latch. Brother Jan, where his body was a shaking, his mouth was a quivering, but he never said a word. And the master got mad and madder because it couldn't make him holler, Nigga, don't that hurt? Brother Jan, where? I was sitting on my mammas and pappas' the steps of crying. All the niggas was gathered up out there. And out of a while, they couldn't take it no longer. They had to go inside their cabin. Uh, but out of a while, Brother Jane where couldn't take it no longer himself. And he said in a loud, hoarse whisper, Master, Master, have mercy on this old nigga. Now, how did William Colbert see himself? The word was literally beat into us. I didn't learn the word nigga from no white folks. I learned it from my mama, I learned it from my daddy, I learned it from my girlfriend, from all my boys who claimed to love me, I learned it from my community, all who claimed to have my back. We have been just ingesting this poison of self-hatred and passing it along to our children. And then we today would get ashamed when we hear their genius of rap music, and rap music is genius, a little twisted, but it's genius. And we get upset when we hear our children calling our sister bitches and hoes. I'll tell you why I don't subscribe to that history. See, this is Walter White, the second black executive secretary of the NAACP. That's right, black. See, that's another way we've been learning to hate each other, skin color. He too black, he blue black. He too light, he damn near white. What are you happy with, black folk? We run from one end of the rainbow to the other. But you've been taught to hate each other. 
You know what people say, my baby cute? She's so cute. Look at all that hair. It's straight and pretty. Damn it. Damn you, don't you let that boy here get nappy. I want it nappy, nappy, nappy. <laughs> His hair ain't what makes him cute. The fact that I made him is what makes him cute. <laughs> oh, my bad. The fact that my wife made him is what makes him cute. But we've been trained with that good hair, bad hair, thick, no, all them Eurocentric values. Damn it, we are a black people. And however we come, that is the way we is. And I love us the, that way. So Walter White used to go deep in the South and investigate atrocities committed against us. And many times the people would think they talking to a white person would tell him everything they did. <laughs> he described what they call the most barbaric act in the history of humanity. He said it happened in 1918 in Valdosta, Georgia. There was a black woman named Mary Turner. And Mary was eight months pregnant. And this mob had killed her husband unjust. And she cried out about that. And they turned their nefarious, racist actions against her. So she run home and tried to get her belongings and leave, but before she left, they caught her. Walter said they took her out in the woods, and they tied a rope around and they dosed her with motor oil and gasoline. You hear her neck crack and pop. Then they set her afire, and he said you could literally smell the burning of her flesh. But she was still alive after all this, and then a man walked up with a big butcher knife, and he carved her from her vagina upward. And she split wide open, and the eight-month fetus fell to the ground, still alive, and it cried when it hit the ground. And this man, he stomped the life out of this fetus. Now, you see the pain you're feeling now? That's the pain I done been feeling. But I feel good now, because Mary Turner's death is not in vain. Uh, none of my brothers and sisters who died under the title of nigger, that was the last term many of them heard, they didn't die in vain. They've at least cleansed me. Never go that way no more. You black women, look how you outnumber black men in here. When I went out there to protest, black women, you were there. <laughs> Always been there for us. And I contend this, not from a popularity standpoint, but just from the truth of what history has taught. Any man that does not appreciate black women does not know his history. Now, I'm saying this. I'm not saying that I couldn't marry nobody else. But I just don't think no other woman is strong enough to deal with me like my wife. <laughs> they, they, can, they don't understand me. Shit, sometime I come home, I'm mad as a house. I'm mad. Hotter than fish grease. But my wife, she know how to deal with her man. My black, beautiful wife. She is a black, boy, that girl. That, look at her. <laughs> I ain't got no shame in saying my wife is beautiful. <laughs> ain't about her looks that make her beautiful either. It's that old whole sassy thing about her. <laughs> Where you going, Carl? You got my money? You got some money? <laughs> <laughs> Just as southern as she want to be. <laughs> but folks, just look at the pain that, that we've gone through under that title. So I don't subscribe to the word, and I pray, God, that after today, none of you will as well. I mentioned Spike Lee's name, but I will say this. In the immortal words of Spike Lee, wake up! That's what we need to do. We need to wake up. Let us learn to love each other. Ain't but a handful of us in the city, and we at war with these people. Mr. Mayor, we at war with you. We ain't at war with you because we want to be, Mr. Mayor. Can you just zoom up on me? <laughs> zoom up on me so he can look at this and understand. We're not at war with you because we want to. You claim to value us, but we sent a report to you. You say, well, those people who got discriminated against, we won't worry about them. We will deal with the people in the future. No, sir, you need to deal with us right now. Gary Zarker, your boy that you want uh, recommended, let me officially say to you now that the NAACP will come out and say that for all the atrocities encountered at City Light with black folk under Zarker's administration, the NAACP is here officially 
saying to you, Mr. Mayor, and to all of Seattle and the city council, we are not in favor of Zarker. We do not want him back. Bring somebody here that is proof that they value us as a people. Did you zoom in on that, sister? Excellent. <laughs> there will be no shame in our game. We are not, I repeat, we are not here just ruffling things to be ruffling, but understand this. In the words of Frederick Douglass, any man that professes freedom but detests agitation is a man who wants crops without plowing the field. He wants rain without thunder and lightning. This NAACP, we are thunder and lightning, and we bout to strike. God bless you all. Thank you.